Hello and welcome to Digging for Drez. This time around, we've got a bit of a rescue mission. We've got to save Pat Len Kerman. As in, Postman Pat? Yeah. Now, for this, instead of building a new rocket, we can just repurpose one we already have. Tourist Trap Orbit. Because, well, it's a rocket with two seats on it. Although, yeah, so you are going to have to be in the bottom capsule. Now, we are here, and our target, Patlin's Hulk, I'm assuming that's his capsule, is there. We want to rendezvous with him in an 83 kilometer orbit, so we will wait until he is just behind us. That way we can launch into a higher orbit and let him catch up on us. <coughs> and launch! So the key with rendezvousing with a, with a target in orbit is to, you generally want to launch just after the target has yeah, passed over your position and then you can launch below it. So the trick is, if once you're in orbit, if the target is in front of you, so, if he was here, then we would launch into a lower orbit. That way our orbital period is shorter, and we catch up on him. If, like now, we launch and he's behind us, then we launch higher and let him catch up on us. Whoa, slow down a bit there. Again, managing that acceleration so that we don't overspeed. And booster separation. Boosters tumbling. No, we want orbit. What's our time to approach? This 40 seconds. Ah, oh, looks like he's gonna make it in front of us by a fair way. Okay, where we want this T minus number to be if not increasing, at least at around one minute. That's a sign of an efficient launch. If I had a um, engineering module on this rocket, I would be able to get that information in the uh, normal view. And I do have access to those now, but I just haven't put one on this rocket yet. Oh, and that stage burnt out. So we've had Miko in stage set. We're on to stage two. So we are at forty eight kilometers. Let's just slow down a bit. Hmm. So He's at 83, average of about 82.5, so we will aim 
for an orbit of 75. Yeah. Oh yeah, there we go. Yeah, because we are so high, there is next to no atmosphere here, so we won't slow down too much. Space. Let's add a maneuver so we can start making this nice and efficient. Okay, so that's a circular. Okay, we can work with a periapsis of 72. Missed the maneuver by a little bit, but that's alright. It's not terribly much. Now, to get as close as possible, we want to match inclinations. Yeah. And also... Just adjusting normal and anti normal to tweak my encounter. 1.6 kilometers is pretty respectable. And using the maneuver nodes, you generally end up with a rather slow approach. Which is most often desirable. Because if you're hurtling past your target at several kilometers or several meters, let's try that again, several hundred meters per second, that's better, it can be quite hard to get a good encounter. And, okay, wasn't watching that. Apparently, we're going to dip down into the atmosphere by a tiny margin. That's a thing to watch out for when making when making rendezvous at such low altitudes. It's not normally a problem if you're rendezvousing with a station of your own because personally I don't put stations any lower than about 150 kilometers, which gives me plenty of room above and below it to make these sorts of maneuvers. But a dip that low shouldn't affect us too much. And we're back into space. Let's just keep time accelerating around. target mode, and there we are, so he's just about passing us, so what we do is we burn to kill our relative velocity, and then sort of stagger our way in. This is not exactly the most efficient way of doing things. 
but it's by far the easiest. And we've got enough fuel to stay out here for doing this sort of thing for a long, long time. And looks like we might end up in the dark. Okay, here he comes, so we start slowing down. Burn a little off center to push our velocity vector onto the target. If I had RCS on this, I'll be able to use that to trim our approach. But just using the main engine is good enough. And it looks like he is in a capsule. That's a nice addition. Previously, there was just a Kerbal floating out in the middle of space. So let's see if we can get a bit closer. Now we don't want to smack into him. So we just want to get a bit closer so you can sort of just step out. And also don't want to blast him away with our engines. So now we turn to an orientation where he can easily get in and then jump him out. Press yes. L to turn on the lights. And you know what? No. Okay. It's always a good idea to try for an EVA report because you you never know, you might be above a biome that you haven't been to yet. You can never have too much science. And there we are. He is aboard. Later on, once we get claws or something like that, I might come up again and deorbit this capsule. But at the moment, we don't really need to worry about it. So let's see. Now it's just a standard return, burn retrograde. To get a periapsis, this is at about 30 kilometers. And look at that. I'm going to fly by debris. And now it's just a standard re-entry. Seen it a few times already. So I'll cut back once we get back to the space center. And we're back. Didn't get any science for that mission, but we do have a new Kerbal in our roster. Now we have a, f a few other contracts here. Let's do a satellite positioning mission. Now, I've already built a rocket to do this. And as you can see below the fairing, it's fairly small, not very much needed for this sort of thing really. And even though the contract says it has to be a new probe built for the energy after the contract has been accepted, it doesn't mean you have to build a completely new rocket every time, it just means you can't reposition one of your existing ones. So if I had 
one of these already in orbit, I couldn't just reposition it to the new contracted orbit, I would have to launch another version, well, another one of it. But seeing as this is the first one, we can just launch straight away. Camera flip again. Now, we're not exactly, well, we're about as far out of position for this polar orbit as we could possibly be. So, I think we'll go for this geosynchronous one. Now, the uh, contract states that we have to not only get into this orbit, but also position ourselves in such a way as to keep line of sight with this location here. So, after watching a bit more of Scott Manley's videos, I have got a bit of an idea of how to do that. First and foremost is to just go ahead and launch. Now I have not tested this rocket yet, so this is the maiden voyage. It should work, should have enough delta V to do what we want it to do. event that it doesn't, if I can turn it, there we go, in the event that it doesn't have enough fuel to, to do what we want it to do, we can just come back and add some boosters. Now, we are turning over a bit slow, so throw down a bit. I think it's because we've got this fairing on the front. It's very difficult to deviate from our pointing vector too far. Now we want to make sure we are as equatorial as possible because this is a geosynchronous orbit. Like your stationary, rather. Geosynchronous can be really any inclination, so long as its orbital period is the same as the rotation of the planet or body that it is orbiting. In the case of Earth, that is obviously 24 hours. So, let's see our time to apoapsis is 52 seconds of climbing. That's good. So we can throttle down. seconds left in this stage. Throttle down, get a couple more seconds out of it. But now that we're up this high, we can ditch the fairing. The way it goes. I love these XL fairings. Now, we are on to the satellite stage. Now I have limited the thrust on this quite a ways. It's only firing at 23% thrust, but that's all we really need. Now we're going to be launching this into a geosynchronous transfer orbit, which is a highly elliptical orbit that will get us up to geostationary or geosynchronous altitude, which is 
about it's two thousand eight hundred and sixty seven kilometers if memory serves correctly but we won't be circularizing straight away notice I'm burning downwards to sort of try and limit my vertical speed I don't think we're gonna have enough oh wow this camera flips enough delta V in this actually what I'm trying to do is get my periapsis up high enough as well so that once we get up to altitude we will not fall straight back down you know what let's just keep running straight and then we'll give it another burst once we get up there we are not going to get up there I've only got 10 seconds left of fuel. Well, we've learnt something. And there we have it. And 38 meters per second is not going to be enough. And that's one of the tricks with these contracts, especially the satellite contracts. You don't always get it right. Whoa! So, we're gonna come out here to Apoapsis and burn retrograde as much as we can and let's see if we can't burn this thing up shall we whoa okay we time accelerated through the planet and exploded yep comes that crash into Copen let's go back to the space center we have found a glitch so we obviously lost money on that flight. So let's keep these wings here. Let's bring them in a little ways. Now we'll do what we did with the Muna flyby ship and add some liquid boosters with fuel cross feed. Oops, that's not the button to press. So we want things to remain efficient. But also want to feed from the outside in. Let's see if we can get the pipes right this time. There we go, we are almost ready. That's better. So this is running on vacuum settings so yeah this is Kerbal Engineer and it's great mod it gives you all the numbers you might need for building rockets the ones we are interested in right now are the Delta V readouts and the thrust to mass so if we switch to atmospheric, so at zero kilometers, yeah, so see here, in the atmosphere, we have, in the first stage, we have 
1400 meters per second. If we were in a vacuum, we would have have almost 1700. So even with flying through an atmosphere, we still have plenty of delta V. So it's very compact. So now this design should have more than enough to get us up there. I foresee that we will be able to get this entire stack here into geosynchronous orbit. So let's just save and launch. So my plan was, if we had enough fuel, was to launch into a geosynchronous transfer orbit that had an orbital period of about um, four hours or well, really just that perhaps the outside the atmosphere would have been fine and that way my apparatus would have been at the altitude that we needed but with each orbit the planet would rotate underneath us somewhat which would allow us to target our front position which is what real spacecraft do although um, real space agencies are able to predict and time their launches so that they can have their satellites in position as soon as possible I, however, am not smart enough to do such a thing. Now let's just make a bit of a roll program here. I want these boosters to be discarded sideways. No particular reason other than it looks cool. And this launcher is very similar to the United Launch Alliance Delta IV Heavy, apart from the fins at the bottom. And there's booster separation. The Delta IV Heavy has two boosters on the side of it that are basically the same as the center stack. But it does not have fuel crossfeed. We are coming up a bit flat this time. A bit too shallow. So let's just throttle back a bit. So basically the idea of fuel crossfeed like that is that basically we got this whole rocket, which is what we started with last time, about 15 to 20 kilometers higher and further from the KSC than it was last time. So those boosters basically moved this rocket's launch position to a lot higher, further and faster than it was originally. And that's just a weird way of saying give it more fuel, you can get further. I have next to no idea what I'm even talking about most of the time here. So, burn downwards again to raise our periaps. Get rid of the fairing. Once we get up into larger fairings, like the uh, two and three meter fairings things will start getting really interesting seeing them uh, discarded like that now with that last launch I said we lost money and we did we lost money for the probe but I have stage recovery so I think we would have gotten money back from that 
booster stage that we dropped early on. Now let's watch our apoapsis as it comes up here. And there we go, our periapsis is outside the atmosphere. Apoapsis gets to 2,876. You know, we have a lot of fuel left over in this, really, but we don't need it. And with that boost from the decoupler, gives almost all the boost that we needed. Two six eight, two six three. I can live with that. Now let's point at the sun and hit an action group. There we go. So we've got our Sputnik-like antennas and a little service bay in here. And in here we've got some batteries and the avionics engineer thing. Also reaction wheel. So, it's really a very tiny commsat. Now, we want to get above here, or a line of sight to there at least, and it looks like we are going to get there. Very nice. So, let us plan a maneuver that will allow us to match this orbit that we need. How far out are we in terms of... Okay, 0 0.5 degrees. Nope. That's wrong. Now, unfortunately, the nodes don't show me the change, so I just have to eyeball it. And we burn normal to get out periapsis and apoapsis exactly where we want them. Okay, we're not going to be able to tweak that. That should get us where we need to go. We don't have to get it exact, we just have to get it in approximately the right place. So we're not going to be directly above it, but we're going to have a very good line of sight to it. So three minutes, two minutes, one minute. Okay, let's slow it on down. Now. 17 seconds is what we need. There we are. Okay. Apparently, 20 seconds is what we needed. My bad. And I didn't really need this service bay because we had the fairing. But it was there, I had it, so I used it. Plus having the doors open like this sort of makes it look like radiators. Oh, there we are. So, does the contract like that? There's the polar orbit. Yay! 
We ticked all the boxes. We have now got a payout. Oh. Whoops. I did all that. And I forgot to put a thermometer on this. Damn. Well, now that we have a launcher that can actually get us up here... And we know that we can get up here... I'm just going to put up another satellite off camera. I know it might be cheating to some people, but hey, we know we can do it. So, let's not just beat around the bush. But for this one, let's see if we can finally see that re-entry explosion. So we have now lost money for both launches. That is not good. And this time I'll use the warp here function. So yeah. If a space agency lost two launches in a row like that, especially if it was a if they were commercial launches, they would probably be finding it a bit hard to get business. Now let's just make this thing tumble. Make it look good. Although, uh, the Russians did lose that, um, Progress spacecraft. But then, that is the first one they've lost in years. I don't know the full story about that yet, but from what I have seen, it was uh, a malfunction with some of the navigation antennas not deploying, so they couldn't communicate with it. And for those of you who may not know, the uh, Progress spacecraft is one of the... Um, basically the uh, cargo trucks for the International Space Station. It's launched from Kazakhstan and is essentially an unmanned version of the Soyuz. And I think this thing's going to make it down without burning up too much. That is remarkable. And it looks like we've got a bit of a... Um, Glitch in the renders here. Whoa, that antenna is glowing. I'd say this antenna was pretty close to uh, going poof. But anyway, if we can't get A re-entry explosion will get a crash. And really crashing a satellite into the ground is not a good idea. And there are bits left over. Well, let's recover those, shall we? It's always good to get a little bit of money back from your failures. But this episode is starting to run a bit long, so... Next time, we will have a proper synchronous satellite and I think we might do some more rescues and maybe some part tests as well so until then see you next time <laughs>